Hello, everyone. Thank you all for joining us today in such large numbers. It is always such a pleasure to be on the stage of the Bucharest Forum. Um, truly, truly a pleasure. I will invite my, my panelists to join me on stage uh, for, for this important panel on th uh, Thread 1, A Reconstructed Ukraine. So um, online with us today, we have two guest speakers, but in person, John Hugo, General Secretary and CEO of Rotary International and Zhuzhana Seleni, Director of the Central European University Democracy Institute Leadership Academy and foreign policy expert and for, former politician, a notable voice of civil society in Central and Eastern Europe. Thank you both so much. Um, and I, I'm not sure we have the connection with the other two panelists. Oh yes, here you are. Uh, it was a problem with the uh, with the screen. So thank you so much for joining us online. Chair of the committee of the RADA on Ukraine's integration into the European Union, Ivana Klimpush. Thank you for joining us. And also um, online from Ukraine, Mr. Mark Magalitsky, Associate Director, Deputy Head of Ukraine for the EBRD. Thank you, thank you for joining us. Um, before we proceed with the conversation um, in this panel, and I'm sure not much needs to be added on what we should be discussing with regards to building a brighter future for a region that is so, so severely um, scarred by the horrors of the war and the destruction. I would like to give uh, the floor to Commissioner Vareri, Commissioner for European Neighborhood and Enlargement, to bring on stage the key elements of this brighter future considering the enlargement announcement yesterday. So we're going to hear his remarks as opening statements and then we're going to come back to the panel. Dear participants of Bucharest Forum, ladies and gentlemen, as Russia's war of aggression against Ukraine enters the 624th day, we cannot list all the terrible suffering and devastation it has caused. During these days and months, the EU has stood unequivocally with the people of Ukraine and will continue to do so. We showed unprecedented unity and solidarity at the level of our citizens and governments. We provided all kinds of support, including humanitarian, economic, macro-financial assistance and military support. Since the start of the war, more than 82 billion euros has been made available by the EU to support Ukraine. Ladies and gentlemen, Today's conference goes beyond assessing the past months as it focuses on the country's reconstruction. Indeed, the EU will play a vital role in this work as Ukraine's recovery and reconstruction cannot wait until the war has ended. In many regions of the country, it can start already now. It is also clear that the reconstruction efforts should go hand in hand with the reforms to build a modern and resilient country. To this end, the European Commission proposed a new instrument, the Ukraine facility, worth 50 billion euros to support Ukraine's reconstruction and reforms until 2027. At the core of the Ukraine facility is the Ukraine plan, which will cover recovery, reconstruction and modernization of the country based on an economic growth vision for the short to the medium term. By developing the plan, Ukraine will own the reconstruction process. The government only needs to ensure that as the plan is progressing, there is an inclusive and open process so all the main stakeholders can have a say. It will also be important that all donor efforts are aligned to avoid adding complexity to an already difficult recovery phase ahead including when it comes to reforms and conditionalities linked to our aid. Here, I want to mention the role that the multi-agency donor coordination platform continues to play. As its co-chair, the European Commission aims to strengthen this unified vision of a reformed and prosperous Ukraine. Ladies and gentlemen, 
The historic decision of the 23rd of June 2022 by the European Council to grant Euro Ukraine candidate status provided a powerful impetus to many reforms related to the strengthening of the rule of law in Ukraine. Progress on reforms during wartime has been impressive, but there's still the final stretch to make to ensure this progress continues. Despite very challenging circumstances, Ukraine has made progress on its enlargement path by taking forward key reforms and moving closer to the European Union. Following yesterday's recommendations in the enlargement package, we now look forward to the Council's decision on the next steps. It is our firm belief that the future of Ukraine lies in Europe. Thank you for your attention. So let's turn to an interactive conversation now with my fellow panelists online and um, in person. And I will turn first to, I will, I will give the floor to each one of you to react briefly, one, two minutes maximum, to the statements that the European Commission has made and the European enlargement announcement that we so joyfully all received yesterday. So maybe I will turn first to you, Ivana, for, to share some initial thoughts on the current situation regarding the enlargement to Ukraine. Thank you very much, and thank you for invitation. Um, greetings to everyone. I, I am sorry that I cannot be there with you uh, in person, but very happy that we are conducting this, this conversation today. And I think it's also very symbolic that we have this panel organized in cooperation with GMF, because it's exactly the Marshall Plan that has allowed Europe to come back from, your, uh, from ruins uh, after the Second World War, but moreover, it also has laid ground to um, something that we know today as the EU, to the European community of coal and steel. And so um, I think it's, um, that's why it's important that we are hearing from the European Commissioner today and understand that there is a political will, there is a willingness inside of the EU, and there is a unity in terms of um, approaching the need to, to have the vision how to rebuild, reconstruct. Um, I'd rather pre prefer the, the word maybe even recreate um, Ukraine in the future. And um, yes, we are doing a lot of things already today with the support that is being uh, provided by our partners in economic, humanitarian, financial realm. Uh, but I think that the, um, the challenge of future reconstruction after the end of the war is um, absolutely unique challenge and also unique chance, not only exclusively for Ukraine, but also for the world. I do think that it is really comparable to, to the flight towards Mars, because we have the nation in the center of, the, uh, of, the Europe, um, of, of, of Europe, which, is, um, which has the population that is highly educated, with ha which has uh, incredible innovative and technological potential. It does have uh, incredible IT sector, does have a space sector, I mean, um, has a lot of different opportunities, but at the same time, it's really a war-torn society, and uh, at this moment uh, is a country of a war-torn economy and is a country of uh, badly damaged uh, infrastructure, and is a country that, that uh, sometimes uh, its cities are being turned into dust. So I think the the challenge and the opportunity ahead of us is to uh, build a new, modern, innovative economy that could be exemplary also, not only within the EU, but also uh, for the world as an opportunity and this appealing power of um, the European project. And I hope that um, this uh, Ukraine facility that is still being discussed uh, it will be uh, it will be adopted. It will come into force, but that will be the basis for those um, uh, for those incredible volumes of financial needs and uh, need for investment um, that um, will be uh, will be very much needed here uh, on the territory of Ukraine after the war is over. 
Thank you. Thank you so much, Ivana. And I will just draw a flashback from six years ago when we shared a roundtable in Brussels with the Aspen Institute and GMF talking about the future of the European project. And it's incredibly uh, satisfactory to me to share this panel with you today to discuss the enlargement announcement for Ukraine. Thank you so much for, for sharing that vision that Ukraine has within the European Union. And let's turn to John and let's hear what do you think about the enlargement announcement yesterday and what's the future of Ukraine in the European Union? Well, thank you so much, Clara. Yeah, it was obviously all of us were extremely pleased with that announcement. Of course, the proof's in the pudding and to see if it actually <laughs> winds up happening. But perhaps if I could just briefly, as we talk about Ukraine reconstruction and, and Ukraine's future, um, focus on one aspect that I think is very often overlooked, and that is the, the role of civil society and civil society organizations and nonprofits, the role they're going to have to play uh, in Ukraine's reconstruction. Of course, they're now playing an extremely important role today in filling, a, filling an important need uh, during this terrible, uh, this terrible war. I know my own organization, Rotary, we've uh, provided over $75 million worth of assistance to, to Ukraine. And of course, nonprofits, they, they, they fill a slot and a space that very often government can't. They're, they're much more nimble, less bureaucratic. They have an opportunity to work directly with beneficiaries who may not have the wherewithal to deal with government structures to tap into larger, larger funding, funding sources. So obviously NGOs have, will, are playing a very important role and will need to play a very important role in Ukraine's reconstruction. So the question for me is how do we best maximize the ability of the civil, of civil society to do the best it can to help to help Ukraine. And of course, we've seen two phenomena uh, in Ukraine since the start of the war, and that is an explosion in the in the creation of, of nonprofit um, uh, organizations uh, in Ukraine uh, with varying degrees of expertise, with very varying degrees of seriousness. Um, and secondly, it's becoming quite clear, I see in my own organization, Rotary, other nonprofits getting much harder to raise funds for Ukraine. There's significant uh, donor fatigue out there in terms of helping in helping Ukraine. And so what can we do going forward? And for me, one of the critical issues is to cr put in place mechanisms to try to minimize the level of corruption in the, in the, nonprofit, in the nonprofit sector. And so, you know, a few bad apples can, uh, can ruin the reputation for everyone. And when you're trying to raise money from donors, this issue of effective and honest use of funding is extraordinarily important. So I would suggest a number of things. First, that, we, that Ukraine consider putting in place a, a rating system for, for nonprofits, very similar to Charity Navigator and other similar types of, uh, of, of systems that are employed in the, in the United States. Um, you have Rise Ukraine, there are a number of options out there so that people can sort of trust a given nonprofit that has a higher or, or a lower or lower rating. And the second thing I would suggest is that um, really focus on working with the nonprofit sector to create a what I would call a code of conduct. And at the World for, uh, for Ukraine Forum in Zhechov last month, we did roll out a, a code of conduct that Rotary and many organizations have signed on to. And I would urge all nonprofits to, to sign on to this code of conduct, again, to create credibility, confidence in that space uh, to enable greater fundraising, et cetera. And finally, I think the, there needs to be a much better coordination mechanism at the level of the Ukrainian government um, in terms of a central clearinghouse uh, for you know what is needed, where is it needed, and by when is it needed. Right now, it's kind of the, the very chaotic system. Things are being delivered that aren't necessarily needed, expired medical supplies, etc. And so, to the extent there could be a, a coordinated, centralized system where you can sort of go online and see exactly what's needed by whom, when, and that's a credible need. I think that's going to facilitate the operation of civil uh, of civil society. Um, in, in working on Ukraine reconstruction, both today and, and going forward. Fantastic points, John. And with Zhuzhana's um, approval, I might turn to Mark first for a follow-up on that idea, because I know EBRD has been supporting technical assistance to the Ukrainian government and civil society and nonprofit actors extensively in Ukraine. So maybe we get your thoughts on the matter as well, Mark. Yes, uh, thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, but let me probably start with the big picture and uh, yeah, EU uh, integration uh, first. 
because we also very much welcome strategic uh, decisions taken this week, which uh, launched uh, Ukraine-EU accession. Uh, and this is a big step in, in the right direction, and um, EU integration will be that core of the construction efforts, both in terms of uh, financing and uh, institutional uh, transformation. Uh, so is the Ukrainian plan that Commissioner mentioned earlier. It's a comprehensive program uh, given the scale and direction uh, while providing the space and the opportunity for uh, Ukraine allies and stakeholders such as uh, financial institutions, uh, public and private, and civil society to, to contribute. Uh, European Bank for Reconstruction uh, and Development is, is the leading financial investor in Ukraine. So for us, uh, the work in the country in these difficult times is a, is a core priority. And uh, we see our role in contributing to the process, uh, not in a distant future, but here and now, because uh, despite the war, the economy has to function, uh, both in uh, private and public sector, and we continued our operations uh, in Ukraine uh, and since the start of the war provided 3 billion of financing in such areas as energy security, food security, vital infrastructure, trade finance. And um, we can say that the country is functioning and business carries on, uh, although the situation is far from normal. But at the same time, uh, it will crystallize the true champions, uh, and not only nationally, but globally, because the businesses that can survive the war can survive almost anything. So going forward, we see Ukraine promoting EU integration, opening the market, dialogue, open dialogue with civil society and international community, and uh, inventing new ways of uh, attracting private investment, which will go beyond the con conventional uh, private-public partnerships. So there are some specific challenges like uh, war insurance, uh, large-scale demanding integration of war veterans in business and social life. Uh, and this is already in the public and uh, business attention. And uh, we're working on this uh, and uh, we are happy to discuss it uh, also today with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Now we've heard the, the vision, the plan, the stakeholders, the actors. We've heard what Ukraine is preparing to do. Now, probably what we need to hear is also what the European Union is prepared to do. And again, we have a plan, we have a vision. What are your thoughts on the matter, Zhuzhana? Thank you very much. Um, it's, a, it's a great pleasure to not just be here, but on this day when Ukraine uh, got a candidate status uh, yesterday from uh, the Commission and I'm absolutely sure that this will be approved by the European Council uh, in a couple of weeks uh, and this is really a remarkable uh, input from the European Union and I think uh, uh, Commissioner Varhe was very exact of what how the EU is actually preparing for this big new challenge for Ukraine and other uh, applicant countries. What I would like to make a comment about what actually means Ukraine and these new accessions mean for the European Union, because we rarely speak about that, but this has actually a transformative profile. So the whole EU is changing now, because this is such an extraordinary task for, not just for Ukraine, which is in war, but also the EU to make this accession happening. It's also very, very unique. Uh, this is actually something we've never seen before. It's an accession through war. So why reconstruction, war is happening, and then reconstruction is planned uh, to be implemented. There is also a legal process going on on a complete modernization of a country, uh, which is, is really uh, extraordinary. This is also changing significantly the EU itself. I can say that, that um, the current situation gave the European Union a new purpose. It is an existential issue for all of us. Uh, the EU went through a series of deep crises in the last decade. Brexit was specifically um, 
uh, a deep harm on the identity of the European Union. And I think Europe is not only recovering now, but with this huge um, undertaking, it's really find its new purpose. Uh, just a couple of examples of what are already changing, because this is all undergoing. Uh, the thinking about European security and the defense infrastructure, this could not have been possible just a couple of years ago. And this, there are huge and significant changes, and there is a completely new mindset about the responsibility of European countries for their own security. There is a completely new enlargement strategy, uh, which is also undergoing. So uh, something which have, we, we really didn't see before, when it's not kind of one-time event, but it's a gradual process something like called phased integration. And I think this is very, very important uh, also for the other applicant countries. This is one of a learning point from the previous accession period when my country, Hungary or Romania joined uh, the EU, that this uh, we have to, I mean, the European Union should offer a much more plausible uh, process uh, which would encourage the people of the applicant country to maintain that interest and motivation because otherwise it's just so complicated and so long uh, that what was something we can see as a threat or danger or happening in the, in the West Balkan countries. So it's very important this gradual process that countries, applicant countries do not lose their interest. I don't expect it would happen in Ukraine because there is such an enormous social um, backup behind the accession. This is partly this was the reason of, the, of, the, of Russia's war, that Ukrainians decided that they want to be part of the EU. So if we go back to uh, 2014, uh, that was a kind of origin of the, of, of the clash and probably one reason why Russia uh, later attacked Ukraine. So uh, obviously this, uh, this gradual process also have a, a, an important um, economic impact. So also uh, involving uh, Ukraine into the single market, partly of the single market, that can have also a lot of important uh, element to maintain the export potential. Um, this whole also has uh, a big impact influence on, uh, on EU institutional reform. With Ukraine and the new countries being a member soon, the, the decision-making process should be uh, reconsidered. The unanimity which we maintain at the moment probably is not, is not maintainable. However, it's very important because Europe is composed of very different size of, of nations that you know, the, uh, the construction, uh, the security of participation of all countries can be maintained. And just one last comment, uh, it's the rule of law, uh, which is also an important learning process from the earlier uh, accession. It's not a one-way street. The fact that one country is joining and modernizing, reforms its um, institutional system, democratize it, uh, make strong anti-corruption, is still not a guarantee for a long-term uh, safeguarding of rule of law. So that is something the EU, just as Ukraine, should really take seriously. Uh, and I think the Ukrainian society, and this is another issue for how civil society matters a lot, mm -hmm. that they keep their future governments accountable so uh, the pluralist profile of politics is not losing. Also, uh, the EU must be much better prepared how to uh, monitor and also safeguard its future citizens' rights. Thank you. Thank you all so much for this round table and in comprehensive introductory remarks. And now we're left with 10 minutes for questions and uh, comments from the audience. I know the mic is not traveling through the um, hall. So if there are any questions, there is, yes, there are. And there is a mic on the, the back side of the room. So if you could find your way quickly there, we still have time for a couple of questions. 
please introduce yourself and ask the questions to the panelists. Um, hello, my name is Loredana Urzica Media, and I work in anti trafficking in Romania. And we've been involved in the Ukrainian crisis response here, in mainly to keep people safe while they travel to their final destination. What we noticed this year um, is that there has been a significant decrease in the support of the neighboring countries, including Romania, and most international actors moved from these countries to Ukraine. As a result, many Ukrainians now are thinking to move back to Ukraine, um, not because they are prepared to do so or they have where to return, but because of the lack of support and basic assistance where uh, they are right now. So my question is, uh, while we think and discuss about the reconstruction of Ukraine and the timing, what would be the measures to put in place in order to mitigate these risks related to the movement of people back to Ukraine, of course, from a safety perspective? Thank you. Great question. Um, let's, let's turn. Uh, who was the question addressed to? Any, anyone want, wanting to pick it up? So maybe, maybe I will turn to Ivana. Uh, refugee support outside the borders of Ukraine. We all want Ukrainians to come back to a peaceful society, but what can we do today to support your citizens outside your borders? Well, thank you, but before addressing the question, let me just react uh, to a couple of comments that have been made by my co-panelists. Of course. Um, I, I, I think um, definitely we here in Ukraine do see the great geopolitical change that has happened uh, within the EU due to Ukraine and the brave society of Ukraine that has been holding uh, and standing up to the, to the Russian aggression while simultaneously transforming the country for, um, for, the, for the sake of, of reaching the goal of uh, European and Euro-Atlantic um, membership. And um, I, I do understand that these processes do have a serious impact on the, on the situation within the, within the EU, and it does change the EU itself. And it's important that uh, these changes that are happening right now in the EU, uh, that this process of, of uh, internal reform is not becoming the process that will take hostage the whole European integration of all the nations that are aspiring to become members. So decoupling of these processes are very important and merit-based assessment and uh, go ahead for all those nations that, uh, that want to become EU members uh, is important irrespectively of whether the EU will finish that discussion and that process of change uh, that has started um, in, in Granada, in Berlin and in other, uh, in other discussion uh, platforms that are happening. Uh, also, uh, what John has said, uh, the, the incredible, uh, the incredible uh, ability of the civil society in Ukraine and, uh, and civil society organizations from outside to actually support the whole, the, the whole, um, you know, humanitarian effort, economic effort, military effort here in Ukraine, that's definitely incredible. But I probably would disagree with the approach uh, of centralized uh, reconstruction as such. Maybe we should look for the instruments where all the needs are being put, uh, let's say, in uh, in, in some sort of online platform. But I think it's incredibly important to ensure that we are involving the, um, the, the local communities in uh, um, verbalizing and formulating their needs for uh, reconstruction and making sure that they do have instruments that of reaching out also horizontally to, to their counterparts and that we have the possibility of building the horizontal economy uh, rather than centralized, verticalized um, uh, economic model that has proven its inefficiency um, in the past. Thank and you. So with re and with regard to this, uh, to this question, just very briefly, uh, one more thing. It's not a Ukraine crisis. It is Russian aggression against Ukraine. We appreciate all the support that has been uh, rendered to Ukrainians so far. Uh, how to ensure that the support is there? I think it's the question not towards Ukrainians. I think it's the question towards towards the EU, towards our uh, international partners. But also, I think that Ukrainian state authorities do have to offer some state program in making sure that there are possibilities for people to come back. We do need those people also back in order to rebuild the country and, and really recover from this wounds. 
Fantastic points, Ivana. And I know John wants to pick up on that question as well. I just want to pick up on, the, to, on this issue of rule of law and the importance of EU accession to accelerate and incentivize these reforms. Because I think we, when you look at Ukrainian reconstruction, at the end of the day, it's going to succeed or fail on the basis of the private sector. Ultimately, that's the long-term solution. It's, there'll be obviously significant government funding coming in. Nonprofits will play their role. Um, but ultimately, what will rebuild Ukraine is the private sector. And for the private sector to invest, and I know it's self-evident to say this almost, you need rule of law, you need corruption to be dealt with, you need a legal system where foreign investors come in and have the security, etc. So I think EU accession, in that sense, is extraordinarily important as a carrot, as an incentive to push through these much-needed reforms, because ultimately that is what's going to lay the foundation for the private sector to come in. And that's ultimately what's going to drive long-term successful Ukrainian Ukrainian reconstruction. The bill is enormous for the reconstruction of Ukraine, so you need all hands on deck, as it were. And Mark, I think, referenced the idea of building new partnerships, more innovative ways of engaging public and private actors uh, in this endeavor. We have one more question in the room before the time runs out. Thank you very much. This is Rufin Zamfir from Global Focus Center. Uh, we've heard a lot of uh, really interesting uh, and rather uh, um, how should I put it? Good ideas regarding the EU support uh, for, for Ukraine's struggle, uh, not just the military one, but the economic one uh, as well. But we're talking about this EU and having in mind that next year is going to be uh, EU elections year. Uh, do you think of a mechanism or are we able to secure at least this level of support for Ukraine during the next year? Thank you. Uh, great question, and maybe I will uh, allocate that to Mark, given that there are financial instruments in play, and the, probably the question translates in how sustainable they are on the long term, disregarding political upheavals in Europe. Yes, thank you. Uh, maybe difficult for me to comment on, on the elections, uh, uh, but indeed uh, the instruments uh, that are currently at at, 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 on the table uh, for discussion are actually mid to long term. So we hope and believe uh, that they will not be uh, dependent on uh, specific outcome of the elections in, in one specific year. So we see that there is a general uh, consensus in the EU about support for Ukraine and uh, we hope that uh, this will continue. And if I may uh, reflect on what Ivana was saying about uh, the role of uh, local authorities and uh, uh, the need to avoid uh, like one centralized uh, plan and one centralized solution, I fully agree with that. And uh, our understanding is that uh, Ukraine plan, which is prepared by you, will not be a closed box. It will be like a basis, an open platform, which uh, other players, uh, including local authorities, including private businesses, including institutions of different levels uh, will be able to, to join and contribute because indeed uh, this is hugely important so that the whole society at different levels uh, participate in, in the reconstruction efforts and engaged in the, in the efforts. Thank you, thank you. And final words from Zhuzhana. On, do you want to pick up on the question about European elections next year and commitment to the reconstruction of Ukraine? Well, it's, it's very, very difficult to say what is coming at the EU elections next year. I hope the commitment to Ukraine will remain. I think there is an understanding of European elites that how important it is. Obviously, there, it's not so self-evidently easy. There are a lot of smaller interest conflicts when such a big country is joining the EU, and we are aware of that. But there are larger goals than that. Uh, and I think we, we hopefully learned that, you know, there are some historic moments when these higher, higher aims are really important. And I think the, just can to repeat that, the um, accession of Ukraine is really gave a new purpose uh, that is super important and this is just as important as, as the foundation of the EU itself uh, several decades ago. 
So maybe the enlargement process is the future project of Europe, as we were discussing six years ago. Thank you all so much for joining us today in this important panel. I know we've covered a predominantly European perspective, but thanks to John, we also covered the international um, donor engagement. And I am sure follow-up panels will do justice to the broad topic of what it takes to make Ukraine a safe, prosperous and democratic uh, society, which I think we all, we all want. Thank you all so much for your thoughts and comments uh, and keep in touch for future panels.